G'day and welcome to the Investor Motivation Podcast. My name is Robert Gowdy and this is... Amy Lehman again. G'day, Amy. How are you? <laughs> Good, Rob. How are you? What have we been doing to be missing out on doing our awesome podcast? I know. All those avid podcast listeners out there are wondering where we've been. <laughs> all I, of you. Yeah, I think I saw her the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, welcome back. It's, we've been on conference, we've been studying, we've been doing lots of stuff for the industry. So, we've come back with probably trying to work out really what's important to people, what makes them tick, what makes them feel good. And that's what today's uh, podcast is about, is making sure that, uh, yeah, we're trying to work out what the secret source is to make people feel well. Yeah, how do people feel comfortable throughout retirement when you're no longer generating income from, you know, personal exertion work, how to keep that income coming in, feel confident and secure that you are going to be okay for the rest of your life without work. Yeah, and that definitely makes people feel more anxious about their financial scenario. Once they've finished that work, it it then heightens. But we've also seen people that are still working, knowing that things uh, have been looked after and taken care of, that there is definitely that, and I think I refer to it as the slump in the seat. Mm -hmm. When they see things are going to be fine, there's a level of relief and they just slump in the seat in the office and you just go, oh, that, that looks good, so yeah. we'll be okay. Yeah, there are those investors that have you know, ample wealth for what you know, an average person would think is ample, but in their minds it's you know, all relative and stressful and mm. it is just reiterating that you are okay, here's a projection, we'll lay yeah. it out for you until life expectancy, and you're okay. Yeah. And and, and, yeah, and I think there's that much noise about you know, people talking about wealth creation, you know, when I'm on social media, the amount of property spookers are out there, you know, just, you know, talking about buying multiple properties and you don't have to have millions on top of millions of dollars to to have a successful and well retirement. Yeah. It's far from the truth. It's, uh, yeah, so I think there's so much noise out there that, you know, everyone's got to be financially independent. Well, mm-hmm. we've got plenty of clients that have got a lovely home $800,000 in financial assets, say in superannuation or wherever, that are doing really nicely. And uh, they're, they're also getting some age pension. Yeah, we've got a lot, we're in Australia. We're super, super lucky with the safety nets that we have in this country. And yeah, it's, mm. well, before we get into all of it too much, on behalf of the Investor Motivation Podcast, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we do record this podcast and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. You're um, into it. Yeah, so look, we've, we've gone to chat GPT, we've put in some uh, discussions there, so you know, what our topic is, and it comes up with a whole heap of uh, you know, comments like it provide, number one, is clarity and direction, confidence in decision making, but none of that really tells us, how, how do you get to there? Yeah, how do I personally feel comfortable stopping work and feeling secure for the rest of my life with no income from mm. personal exertion. How do I do it? How do you do it? Um, it's completely foreign to everyone when you've worked 60 plus years of your life to generate income to live day by day. Yes. And that yep. stops suddenly. Mm. How do I do it, Rob? How do you do it? Well, I'm scared. <laughs> well, I think there's, it, it's it's a matter of, we've always got to let the numbers talk for us. And, uh, and I think people need to be realist in terms of what they spend in retirement. Yeah. So you, that scenario that I just gave that you know someone has a very nice home and they have eight hundred thousand dollars, you know that eight hundred thousand dollars from that personal exertion, that effort that's put in, will provide a very healthy you know income stream. Yeah. Centrelink will you know provide a bit more. So how do you do it? It's probably around education. Mm-hmm. It's around the knowledge that there's all these safety nets to look after Australians. Yeah. So again, we are very lucky to to live here. Um, so to know what safety nets are available, to do the projections. Yeah. Um, and if people have aspirations of, and this was a discussion we had yesterday, that all, you know, be, I you know, it was uh, with, a, with, Rachel was in that appointment with me, where I want to help the kids out to be financially independent, mm-hmm. where that would compromise their own independence in retirement. So getting the expectation right that you, you, know, you don't, there's some things that you can't do. Yeah. You know, can you live off 70 grand or 72 grand a year, which is the comfortable retirement uh, limit for for a couple? Yeah. Um, you know, can you do that? But if you say, Rob, but I, I need 100 grand a year, 
and you do the calculations, you say, well, that doesn't quite work. Yeah. But this does. Well, if you go this hard in the first third of your retirement, then the second third and last third might look like this. It's just really yep. understanding how hard you want to go at the start and if you're comfortable to teeter that off or if you just want it to be a nice, you know, comfortable the whole way. Yeah. So, yeah, prioritising what you want to do when you want to do it. Yeah, and, and that the understanding around, you know, splitting your retirement in, in your mind into three phases. Yeah. Um, and you know, one is yep, go go, and one is you're going a bit slower, and then there is then you're not going, yeah. uh, and that is those. I would probably see for my clients at that eighty five plus. Yeah, is the not going last kind of phase? Correct, but but not going. That's not going on big trips. But what it is doing is still um, community. It's still catch up with friends. It's still social. It's it's people that age really value a meal out. Yeah, because. You know, only probably 15, 20 years ago, it's something that they didn't do. So I'm making sure that all my clients understand that the big trips overseas are two, three, four percent of your year. The rest of the time is where you're home and you're doing the normal routine things. Yeah. And if that, if what you value is having a nice cafe lunch once or twice a week with one set of friends and another set of friends, yeah. that's that they're. they're should be retirement goals and objectives as well. Yeah, 100%. But using our our projections around, you know, understanding, you know, in yesterday's chat that we had last night, I asked some pretty callous questions or, you know, and those questions are, when do you think that, you know, what do you think you might get from inheritance? So I'm talking about people's parents dying. It's, it's, it's a tough question to ask, but I sort of need to ask it because it, with the understanding of what you may receive down the track, it can dictate that, well, yes, we can go a little bit more actively and spend more in that first phase, that first third of your retirement where you can and should spend the most amount on a yearly basis. Yeah, exactly right. It's no, it's no good to completely discount that inheritance just purely because you don't want to think about it or you know, some people don't think that's ethical or whatever the reason might be, but then you do risk, you know, cutting yourself short on experiences and fun and building memories for that first third where you are young, fit and able to, yeah. to build memories. And then you're in your, you know, mid eighties and you slow down and then inheritance pops in and you've got, you know, no mobility to be able to have fun. And yeah, and then but the scenario we saw yesterday, the one that you were on in when we asked those questions, Amy, that, you know, that their parents were all 90, around 90 and, and yeah. getting older. Yeah. Um, so the inheritance may not be there for quite some time, um, but it should be a factor. Yeah. And, and it gives you the confidence to say, well, yes, we can spend, we, we know the base is 70 or 72 grand. Mm -hmm. um, and for those clients, we added an extra uh, 15 grand per year because we know that they were going to be golfing, they were going to be with their horses, they're going to do all these extra things each year. Yeah. And Fun then, things fun thing so that happened for 10 years we calculate that in yeah. what does it look like what does it look like when they get to that sort of early to mid 80s where more than likely someone will pass away yeah and then Centrelink you know goes from Centrelink couple where you can have a million dollars of assets to Centrelink as a single which is about 617 grand before it cuts out so the single age pensioners in our community are the ones that do it really tough. Yeah. So I do my projections to bed um, through to that sort of 80, 85. And again, it's all about how do you retire with confidence? Yeah. Okay, based on these conservative numbers, we get to 80, 85, and I've got three or 400 grand left. Yeah. So plus nearly a full age pension, plus that amount means that you will be fine in those years where it's the go very slow time. Yeah. And even for those people that do have, like yesterday's scenario, you know, quite a bit of money, but they do want to, you know, maximise Centrelink benefits while they can, there are so many strategies out there to maximise those benefits. So even though, yes, you'd be fine without Centrelink, but how can we actually make you have even more fun and make you feel even more secure? So there's so many benefits of being in Australia and having safety nets and mm -hmm. Centrelink exempt assets test products that yeah, are available yeah. that people just don't know about. Yeah, and, and even that, you're more, more often than not, you have a husband that's slightly older than the wife, and that was yesterday's scenario as well, where 
you know, all the superannuation assets is in the male's name, the older male. So over the next you know, few years, we'll be shifting assets from him uh, to her. Um, and while she's under age, pension age, uh, and in accumulation in super, not, not a super pension, once, when it's still in accumulation, it's going to be exempt from the assets test. Yeah. So we've got strategies there that will last for two and a half years and it allows us to, now this may be seen as an unethical quote, but I've used it nearly my whole career, that we will spend the government's money first before your own. I've never heard anyone say, Rob, I disagree with yeah. that completely. Um, but most people do say, well, I have paid a lot of taxes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, so I think knowing these things that we're, that's some things that help people feel really comfortable when they go into retirement, mm -hmm. which then allows them to concentrate on the stuff they enjoy. Yeah. And yesterday's clients were horses and golf. Yeah, horses, golf. Not at the same time. Grandkids. I think that's called polo at the same time, so. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so I think some of the other things that I, I believe that really gives people the confidence um, to know it is to understand the levels of safety nets. Yeah. Now, I don't think we should call the money that we've accumulated ourselves as a safety net. That's what we've earned. So probably a bad term for that one. Mm -hmm. But definitely the, you know, the money we've created is you know, the wealth when we retire is there for us to use. We've earned that right yep. to have a good income in retirement. But let's say we have a huge amount of fun, we use a lot of that. Well, as a couple owning their own home, anything below, um, it's, it's about a bit over $1 million, anything below $1 million, excluding your home, will be, you know, mean you'll start to get a little bit of pension. And as that goes down over time, your pension will increase. Yeah. So that's your first safety net. So you've got your own money, You've got Centrelink to, to chip in, and obviously it depends whether you're a couple or a single homeowner or not, um, and that affects you know, obviously what pension you receive. But let's say you got a pension and then you continue to spend all of your money down to zero. You've got no financial assets left, but you own your home. Yep. You've then got the Home Equity Release Scheme, which I believe is a, an amazing and an awesome another safety net. Yep. Um, and more than likely on all the calculations that I've done, you'd only need that right at the back end of your, your life. That's exactly right. And that's, you've also got the safety net of having a downsizer opportunity where you can, if, if it's still the family home that you've lived in when you had all of your kids and it's on a land that you simply can't look after anymore, there's the opportunity to sell that home, downsize, and then that frees up more cash and you can still do that home equity access scheme on you know, the smaller house. So there's Correct. Yep. a million strategies along the way that are available. Yeah. It's just, you know, knowing about them and deciding what's right for you. Yes, yeah. And, you know, leaving, you know, leaving money to beneficiaries is important for some. It, the old ski strategy, uh, spend the kids' inheritance, doesn't seem to be something that comes up in our meetings as much as what it used to back in the day. Um, so I feel as though that people are very comfortable in saying, well, it's fine if we spend the capital. Yeah. More often than not, the kids are already doing pretty well. Yeah, or well, there's, instead of the ski, now it's the kippers and it's the kids in parents' pockets eating away at the retirement savings. So because parents are so aware that they have contributed to deposits along the way, that they're happy that, you know, that's their early inheritance in a way. Yes. We're going to spend exact everything we've got and the kids will be fine. Yep. We've done our bit. Yes, yep. And look, and, yeah, we're... We as advisors are really mindful of obviously, yeah, first home buyers and mm. you know the amount of debt that's out there and you know for for grandparents and and parents that's something that we're thinking very deeply about and what strategies we can implement to because that's becoming a, an increasing objective for our retiree clients. Yeah. They want to help their children, their grandchildren out. Um, you know, it's probably children, grandchildren now where you know there are. They're after their first home and how the hell do you buy something in our major capital cities and even in we are three hours regional three hours away from melbourne in regional center yeah. and some of the prices you know since COVID, you know makes it defies common sense yeah. um but it's hard the debt levels are high and there's there's financial stress out there but yeah. um yeah so that's an objective and can help people um so and that's in again in that those doing those projections, Amy, that if we're doing the projections, they say, well, look, we would like to put X amount aside for each grandchild yeah. or each child. 
just to help them out with the debt. I want to help them out while I'm still alive. Yeah. So we project that, we put the numbers in. What does it look like? Is it bad or do, you know, you know, does it mean you run out of money at, at 75? That's, that's not gonna work. No. And that's where you gotta let the numbers talk. Yeah, definitely let the numbers guide you. Correct, and then that provides confidence, decision-making, all the chat GPT, you yeah, know, topic so suggestions, you know, they're the things that, uh, you know, provide uh, that, that clarity and security for, for retirees yeah. and, and any client that we deal with, really. Yeah, there's, yeah, some, you know, common sense basic things that just make anybody feel secure and comfortable in, in any stage of life with finances and obviously always having that cash buffer and that emergency fund behind you yep. to know that if anything was to happen, you're actually okay. You've got some cash there to live off. Yes. Yeah, and that's something we've been doing of late when, when our review clients come in. Mm. You know, we've been, you know, we haven't been buying anything at all. The share market has just you know, torn away in the last six months, 12 months. Mm. Some of the returns are obscene. The NASDAQ has done 33% over the last 12 months. So, you know, is now the time to be buying feverishly? In my view, no, it's not. Um, if, if you're a 20 year old investor, invest now and you know, retirement's you know, a long time away, it's completely fine. But just after such a big run up, there will more than likely be a correction. Yeah. Something will happen where we'll come off that. Yeah. Um, so we've been selling a bit, you know, securing the cash account and the future pension payments. Yeah, and that makes, even when you do have a large amount of wealth, that still makes you feel even more secure because you're not, you never at a forced sell position where you do need a top up of pension payments, but there's no more cash left. Mm -hmm. Those pension payments have been paid out. Then you can sell off a section or a portion of the market while it is at such a high. Yep. To then top that up, and you've got two, three years worth of pension payments sitting there. Yep. To just yeah. Fantastic. Enjoy the market. Perfect, Amy. Um, and of course, I think education and knowledge has been very key for our clients. Yeah. During the COVID uh, crash, you know, that was down 37%. That was a big number down. And I think the, you know, most people will say, oh, gee, Robbie must be working really hard at, you know, keeping people invested. Well, we weren't doing that. And you were there at the time, Amy, for, for COVID at the start? Uh, no. Not quite? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what our clients were doing, um, because a lot of my clients were there for the, uh, the tech wreck in 2000, they were definitely there for, the global financial crisis, but my clients are ringing and saying, well, Rob, what are we buying? Yeah, that's so true. that's that knowledge, that education that we've provided that they know what to do at the tough times. Emotionally, the heart is saying something completely different. And that's, I think, having a financial advisor that has the experience and the knowledge has been through tough times, mm -hmm. that also helps with their, you know, living a confident and secure retirement, that they know that things are, you know, that your, their advisor will react well for them. Yeah. Yeah, so in a... I'm emotionally unbiased. Yeah, very patient, knowing how to react, you know, how to make the right decisions at the tough times. Yeah. And so I think that definitely helps. And that's, that's that education, that knowledge part, which we focus on substantially from an investment point of view. Yeah. Because we can, in theory, talk about these things but when the shit hits the fan, when markets crash and there's big corrections and the news is bad across the board. Yeah, doesn't make anyone feel good. Yep, investor psychology will kick in and you will want to get out. Yeah. So, lots of things to consider. Yeah. But I think it's, it's about letting the numbers speak, it's about knowledge and education building yeah. and having a good relationship with your advisor who you know will make the right decisions at tough times. Yeah. Let the advisor be that steady rock to just keep you grounded yeah. all the time. Yeah, keep you focusing on the stuff that actually matters. Yeah. And it's not your portfolio evaluation. And this is something I've spent so much time on recently, mm -hmm. which I no doubt has spoken about, that your job in retirement is to build the memories to reduce the regret down the track. Yeah. It, your job in retirement is not to you know, check your portfolio on a daily basis. No. Hiding to nowhere. You'll feel a little bit all right when it goes up, but you'll feel darn right shit when it goes down. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the research on that is just very clear and evident. Yeah. That you'll, you'll feel 10% or 50% happy, but you'll feel 150% crap when it goes down, when it's crashing. Yeah. How do we fix volatility, Amy? What's my... 
So Don't look in at the portfolio. Yeah, that's my cheeky one. Um, where yeah, how do you reduce volatility in the share market? Stop looking at it. Yeah, it's always going to be there, and it's if, if we can educate you to understand that, then that's beautiful, and you can look as much as you want if it doesn't affect your emotions. Correct. But if you are told and told and told, but it's still just you're you're a heart person. You go with your emotions, then just don't look. Yeah, and if you want to know what your businesses are doing, go and read the quarterly reports, yeah. if it's an American business, half yearly or annual reports, if it's an Australian business. Yeah. Go and read, find out what they're doing. The people working these businesses are not sitting there shivering in a corner looking at the, the share market and worried about the share price. They are improving products and services. Yeah, and they're possibly buying their own business while it is at a low. Yep, Warren Buffett will be doing that, absolutely. Yeah. Anything else to add, or that's probably a good good amount? Um, it's probably worth mentioning. We also had another client who his father was, what, 93 years old and mentioned to his son the other day that he and his wife had a lot of fun throughout their early retirement, and the comment was always, oh, we're having fun, and she was always really encouraging to do even more travel than they were. But he just yeah. thought, oh, no, like we, we are travelling a little bit, so let's just be a little bit more conservative, have our fun, but not spend it all. And now, you know, she's passed and he's in retirement, saying to his son, I actually do wish we did more. Yep. So it's, even though you know you've got a lot of money, the goals-based advice is to almost end, there is that retirement, you know, die with zero, mm -hmm. to make sure you have had as much fun as possible. And the only way you can really do that and feel comfortable with it is by running the numbers. Yep. To know that yes we're having fun but we can actually have more fun and be fine yes yep i've always said that no client's going to come to me when they're in their not when they're in their 90s mm -hmm. and they're too old to really do anything about it they're not going to pat me on the back and say well done rob you've made us so much money look at my bank account mm -hmm. they're going to say rob why the hell didn't you tell me i could have done more yeah um, yeah it's never what we want to hear from the clients mm. we want to hear about the stories yeah. the fun the photos. And there's postcards. Yeah, postcards. Yeah. You wouldn't know what a postcard is, you oh, young Amy. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you very much for everyone for tuning in. If you've got any podcast topics that you would like covered, uh, please let us know. Yeah. I think it's worth mentioning on YouTube, there is 600 and something uh, videos there that we've been putting up over time. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, yeah, it's all personal finance. Yeah, a lot of our passion goes into our podcast and our YouTube, Hello TikTok. Um, it's all about, yeah, educating people. And so if anyone has any questions, uh, please let us know. And TikTok, who's streaming live at the moment, feel free to ask a question if you've got one. Yeah. Cool. Otherwise, until next week. Next back week. On. We're back, back on the weekly train. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everybody. See Bye. ya.